Okay, so first of all, thank you everyone for making the time. I know it's Saturday. Uh, I know there's other things you'd probably rather be doing, um, but given that the the ministerial oh, yeah, sorry, uh, the ministerial is happen starts in just over a week, and we have a new chair's text that's just come out. Um, you know, it, it's important that we we sort of meet when we can to get prepared for the for the upcoming ministerial. So. Uh, for for today, uh, we'll just thinking that I can give a brief run through of where things are at with the text, uh, with a little bit of input and, and insights into what that might mean, uh, particularly for for fisher folk, and then we kind of wanted to leave a bit of space for, pardon me, discussion, so we can you know sort of discuss what we want to be doing and how we can sort of best. Uh, work together and, and amplify the voices of fish folk ahead of the ministerial or and, and during the ministerial in particular. Um, so maybe I'm just going to share my screen for for those who are on, on a computer uh, and to be able to see um, it's it's given given there's a lot of text it's um, you know sometimes it's easy to just work off off a, a document. Um, great. Sorry, no, slideshow. All right. So tell me, I assume people can, can see that, um, sing out if you can't, but I will operate on, on the silence, uh, in, in like the WTO we will operate on silence equaling cons consent. Uh, okay. So like I mentioned, we, we have a new chairs text. It's, largely the same as the the previous chairs text and and you know there's a lot of similarities between the new text and even what was knocked back uh at the previous ministerial but to understand it uh you know it starts off with a a list of prohibitions so it says you know it, it classifies as subsidies that contribute to overfishing over capacity um you know subsidies uh, that include, but you know, it's not a limited list. So things like subsidies for buying and building boats, uh, maintenance, which is which is a new addition uh, in this chairs text, um, but is you know it's quite a significant amount of subsidisation goes into maintenance, uh, income support. Uh, again, that's there's a slight twist or not a slight addition to that, which is an attempt to allow for. Uh, off-season income support. Um, you know, I know know a number of countries are still unhappy with that, uh, but also things like you know equipment for vessels, fuel, ice bait, personnel, at sea support, uh, and price support for fish caught. So it's quite an extensive list, um, which is worth keeping in mind when we sort of you know if it, it it starts off with saying these things aren't allowed, and then sort of works back to uh, seeing how they can be allowed. So, you know, but it's worth keeping this in mind when when you know, it's con you're considering what, you know, if your uh, country is caught up in some of these um, carve-outs or how it's caught up in the carve-outs. So after the prohibitions, ooh, um, oh, sorry, I've gone too far. Uh, it then has, it basically says you can't provide those subsidies unless you can demonstrate um, that the, the fishing is sustainable. And so the first part of this uh, says, you know, to, to prove that, to demonstrate that it's sustainable, you have to explain um, how the measures ensure or they you know, can reasonably expect it to uh, ensure the biological sustainability of the stocks. And, you know, and then has a, a time frame for when you must notify this to the, to the WTO. Uh, you know, this, I mean, we've discussed this before for some other um, webinars, but this, this is very much a capacity issue for a lot of countries, you know, to be able to prove your stocks are, are sustainably being fished is, you know, involves the money to measure, to manage, and then the capacity to notify the WTO. So there's quite a significant hurdle to be able to meet uh, that first flexibility. Um, and so, you know, so, so that, that, that's one of the issues. 
Uh, the second part to this is sort of a little caveat for developing countries, which just says that if you, you know, if you're not a distant water fishing developing country and aren't one of the 10 biggest subsidizers, um, but then you, all you need to do is demonstrate the same thing, but in, in your regular notification. So that could be every, every year, every two, or even every four years. So again, it's still, uh, it's still an, a, a, a threshold, a capacity threshold that a lot of countries are worried about. Um, but, you know, so th th this particularly will uh, apply to the countries who fall outside of some of the, the developmental flexibilities I'll talk about soon. Uh, so after the sustainability flexibility, yeah, th this is how you, what you must do to meet this um, threshold. So you have to inform of the, the conservation management measures, the status of the fish stocks and, and how you're measuring them. So what reference points you're using, catch data by species uh, and information on fleet capacity. And uh, so before the, these must, uh, oh, sorry, before I get to the next point, the, this information is interesting because this is often information sought by those countries who are wanting to fish in someone else's waters. So, you know, when they're negotiating access to, a, to someone else's waters, say in, in, for Pang's experience into the Pacific, you know, if they, some of this information is quite uh, commercially sensitive or it allows those countries to be able to bargain. And, and you know, that they, it's like the, the negotiating position is stronger if they hold all that information. But the WTO is asking for this as part of its, um, you know, mechanism for proving sustainability. So it's, in, in, it's important to understand why this stuff is there when it's not necessarily, you know, stopping, um, you know, subsidies being provided. Uh, and then all of, all of this must be provided in a way um, for other countries to challenge. So, you know, uh, the EU might come back and say, we disagree with how you're managing your stocks. So th this is all this initial sustainability flexibility. Uh, the next part, sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, let's try, yes, great. Sorry, I couldn't move my slides for some reason. Uh, there's two additional clauses. Uh, this is within this initial prohibition. Uh, and that says you can't provide the subsidies contingent on fishing outside of your exclusive economic zone. So basically, you know, as long as you're not saying we will only give you this subsidy to fish somewhere else, then you can quite easily get around that. Um, and then the next uh, part is, and you know, th this this is interesting only in that it's being pushed. We think we believe by the EU to try and benefit its fleets, not having to pay back the government for the negotiated access agreements. Um, so, you know, again, it's this, uh, an example of the big fleets sort of doing what they can to get away from being caught up in this agreement. Oops. Uh, okay, and so now special differential treatment. Uh, this is the part that's, you know, one of the, of the most interest, I think, for a lot of fisher folks, because it, gets to the nitty degree of how you may or may not be excluded. Um, you know, th there was a, a mandate from the sustainable development goals that it had to be appropriate and effective. Um, you know, the, you, the, that's the lens, I think, with which we should judge what's being discussed. And, you know, my, my interpretation is that it's falling apart from that. Um, and it's also worth considering that when, you know, the the mandate for dealing with fishing and overcapacity subsidies, small scale fishers are, are not responsible they, for the overfishing of stocks and the receipt of most of those subsidies anyway. So they're, they're a very small part in this whole problem and not even really contributing to the problem, yet they're getting caught up in this agreement. So for small scale fishers, when we consider the, the flexibilities for developing countries, um, I'll sort of run through how it's being um, framed and then and then you can kind of see just what um, what's happening in terms of 
Um, oh, sorry. That's, um, oops, I lost it now. Uh, the, um, you know, the, the flexibilities. Oops, where's my slide share? Oh, sorry, I've left this all up. Um, that's fine. Uh, sorry, let me just go back to where I was. Yeah, just take your time. No, I find it sorry. very difficult to manage this part. <laughs> I'm on Zoom. This I find it up and down here. Yeah. For some reason, it's not. Oh, here you go, slide share. All right. Um, it's like when it takes up the whole screen, it then becomes hard to see what else is happening. Uh, okay, so the the, the four, that's like a lot of thresholds within this flexibility. So the first is saying for LDCs. Basically says as long as you're an LDC, you're not um, caught up in the prohibition. So you can provide those subsidies that were mentioned above. Um, the only then then the the area of contention is the sort of the transition period that's agreed to. It's currently um, up for negotiation, but for those big country big fishing nations um, like Bangladesh. Uh, they, you know, they have a lot of stake at this because that transition period, once they come off that, I think they will then fall into the categories like um, in B.3, which I'll get to in a second. <clears throat> Pardon me. The, the next category is for the, the divided developing countries now between those who catch under 0.8% of global marine capture. So any, any country that is under that threshold they uh, are allowed to provide these subsidies mentioned uh, in 8.1. And for those, so for, for small scale fishers within those countries and LDCs, um, you know, you're not caught up in these um, prohibitions as such. But if you're a country who's sitting around that threshold and, you know, you, you very much have a stake in making sure that, you know, whatever happens is, you know, you know, for future changes, you're you're protected as well. And so when we talk about those countries who are above the 0 0.8 threshold, what's being discussed at the moment is a transition period. So there'll be a, a time bound amount where you know they, they can provide these subsidies, but it's limited. And then they once they do that, they will eventually have to move on to that sustainability exemption I, I discussed earlier. And, you know, th that all comes down to proving to the WTO that your fishing is done sustainably. So for, you know, for small scale fishers, you know, unless you fit into the next category, um, the government will have to meet that sustainability exemption to be able to provide any subsidies, um, you know, to your communities. But the then goes on to argue or well, make, make a specific reference to small scale fishes. Um, and it basically says it can, you know, can provide it for fishing for low income, uh, resource poor or livelihood fishing uh, or fishing related activities up to either 12 or 200 nautical miles. And okay, it's, it's important to see that this is, there's a big change in this than previously. Um, previously it was either 12 or 24 nautical miles and the the criteria that low income resource poor livelihood thing was um uh not was cumulative so previously it would say low income resource poor and, um and livelihood fishing which meant that you had to meet all three of those and then fish within the the geographical limit <clears throat> so they've, they've eased that a bit by saying it can be any of those and then it has a quite a significant, um, uh, you know, range of uh, geographical limits. So, do the twelve nautical miles, which our understanding uh, is that a lot of fisher folk uh, go beyond that quite easily, um, and then two hundred nautical miles, which is not as easy, but not impossible. And so, the other important thing about this is, excuse me, the um, you know, th there's now a requirement that the, a country invoking this has to send to the WTO its sort of 
uh, operational definitions of what that fishing is. Uh, this is at the moment, like this is a, a positive step in the context of you know the, the, this sort of um, problematic approach to dealing with small scale fishing. Um, because it, it sends it back to the national level to determine and define, which we've argued that if you're going to have this definition, it's the nation, you know, the, the member that should define that. Um, now, the big question would be whether or not, um, you know, a, a member, say India, sends its definitions, uh, operational definitions to the WTO, whether or not another member can come back and say, we disagree with that. We don't think that's low income fishing. We don't think that's resource poor. Um, so the, at the moment, it's not. It doesn't. We know country. Some countries are pushing for that to be able to to you know come up with a a more generalized WTO definition of of these things, or at least a range of um, characteristics. But at the moment, in the text. Um, my read on the text is that it doesn't imply that yet, you know, unless unless it's sort of it's the assumption is that it would be open for contestation. Um, but you know, in in saying this, that the text did just come out, you know, this morning, so we're all still um, coming to coming to terms with it. But for a lot, for I think for a lot of fish folk groups, this is kind of you know, especially those. Um, yeah, because there's quite a number of countries who sit above that 0.8 threshold of global marine capture who have, you know, significant populations of fisher folk and, and cramming them into this this sort of definition um, is, is fraught. And I think we need to see this in particular as a major concession point in the WTO negotiations of the ministerial. Like I think this is one of those things that will be um, heavily fought over and contested. Um, uh, and then the the next part of the sustainability or the developmental flexibilities relates to distant water fishing. Uh, and so this basically it it gives a definition of distant water fishing. So it says if you more than two percent of your captured fish is you know from uh, distant FAO fishing regions, then you can't access um, the the small the B point four and B point three. So that means for those countries above 08 percent, then you can't access that flexibility for um, either you know that that transition period or the small scale fishing. And you know uh, th this is really nonsensical because it. Just because you have a fleet that might be fishing somewhere else doesn't really impact what the situation is for your small scale fishers. You know, I think there's a real, it's connecting to sector, to parts of the same, you know, fisheries industry, but that aren't really related at all and are often in contention. So it, it's a really, um, it feels punitive and it, and it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense from sustainability or, or development perspective. Um, there's an alternative for B.5, which um, is just says it, comp those countries with competent fisheries management capabilities are encouraged to not use special and differential treatment, um, which is also slightly absurd because it basically says you shouldn't take any flexibility if you're managing your fisheries stocks, which also just doesn't seem to doesn't seem to deal with the issue at all. Um, so maybe given the time, I will kind of, I'll leave it there. But, you know, I, I think that the key takeaways for this are, you know, the, the definitions around small scale fishers and the need to, I think, push to, um, you know, allow those countries the most flexibility as possible to, to support those communities. Um, and I mean, we can, like, we don't really need to look at that anymore. Thank you. Um, so I can oops, stop sharing my screen now and come back to seeing everyone. Um, so 
I mean, so Runja, I just want to offer you the chance to add anything to to what I presented, um, because you also have been following this very closely, and I think maybe it might have picked up a few things that I might have missed. Uh, no, uh, I think you. it was a very good and very clear uh, presentation, especially of the new chess text. I just wanted to maybe re-emphasize some of the points, what you said, basically, just three, four points. Firstly, that in the discipline section, as Adam said, this sustainability exemption clause, it is still an escape clause for developed countries. They can use it and developing countries do not have the mechanisms to do those notifications. So as we've been saying right from the beginning and we discussed it on the 11th also for those who were present that day, that this sustainability exemption clause, though it means that all developed countries will also have to do this notification that Adam talked about in order to use the sustainability exemption clause. Thing is, they can do it. All the developed countries more or less have the kind of, uh, you know, the mechanisms to do it. Developing countries still do not have. So that is still the great divider in a way. Now, the other thing is this, uh, as Adam said, distant water fishing. Like it was getting away earlier, you know, they are the ones who, those countries who can do distant water fish, fishing, definitely they are the ones who are doing large scale fishing, industrial scale. They are the ones who are doing unsustainable fishing and they are the ones why which we need to, why this agreement is being pushed and justified in the first place because they have depleted marine resources. But as Adam said that under A2, they are actually, it's a very weak uh, provision. It says that only subsidies contingent upon distant water fishing, contingent or tied to, which means you cannot give a subsidy in the name of distant water fishing, calling it distant water fishing. No government can have a subsidy saying, okay, I will subsidize my distant water fishing. But if they say, okay, I will subsidize large scale fishing, I will subsidize whatever, I mean, and using the sustainability exemption clause, then under that route, they can actually even subsidize anybody, including those who are doing distant water fishing. This is the problem with the disciplines. So it still remains an unfair agreement. And the objective of, you know, this so much talk about, we will get the big, big, uh, big ones and so on. As Adam said, all that top 10 subsidies, etc. It's still just a bit of extra notification. It's nothing. I mean, the top 10 subsidizers, especially the developed countries and all the developed countries, uh, they, they on paper, they have this commitment, but the fact is it, they can get away. In the special and differential treatment, as Adam said, the big one, especially for most of you, is the one on uh, the small scale fishers. So it, the definition has expanded a bit. And now at least we see earlier, it was just that only those who fish within 12 to 24 nautical miles would get exemption. Now we see at least in square bracket, 200 nautical miles is there. But as, um, as Adam said, that will be a big fight. That's not going to be given up easily by developed countries, you know. So that, but it's good that it's at least there in the text now in square bracket. Square bracket means not agreed yet, okay. So it's square brackets. There's both 12 and 200 in square brackets. So we'll have to fight very hard for the 200. And as Adam said, that this Small scale, like, you know, governments can define it nationally, but can it then be contested? That saying that, you know, oh, yeah, fine, you have defined it like this, but they, uh, it's actually not meeting the criteria. So that could be another problem. So we definitely still have the fight, kind of the small scale fishers still have to fight till the finish line, I would say, to ensure that they are kind of, uh, their subsidies are exempted. And the other thing that um, Adam said, Adam said, right, that those countries whose, uh, say, 2% of their fishing in terms of catch, 2% of their catch comes from distant water fishing, then they cannot get some of this uh, special and differential treatment. But in here, they have said that earlier it was they cannot get anything. Now, those countries which have shared below 0 0.8, or which is an LDC or graduating LDC, et cetera, et cetera, they, can, they are not coming under this. Even if they have distant water fishing, they can still get the exemption. But interestingly, they have held back the exemption on uh, small scale. I guess this whole, this whole B5 now is actually aimed towards China, that 
small scale fishers in those countries which have distant water fishing above 2% of their total like fishing say they cannot get they cannot provide exemption to small scale fishers idea is i guess that chinese small scale fishers also should not get right adam that because china is say a distant water fishing nation chinese small scale fishers should not get exemption but what i will be worried about as adam said that in other developing countries suppose in future Mm, somehow the percentage of distant water fishing crosses 2%. It means that their uh, exemption for their small farmers will also go. They cannot protect their small scale farmers anymore. So these for me, I think these four or five points like really need kind of uh, thinking through and uh, bearing in mind. And of course, we have still a lot to kind of fight for, a lot of uh, square brackets, which means these are not decided. and um, And we don't know how kind of governments are kind of going to react, how the developed countries, how much they'll fight. Now it seems like an agreement where everybody's trying to squeeze in ex as much exemption they can. EU is, of course, trying to, you know, put in its own. So that was the thing. Distant water fishing is, EU is very good at it, right? They use the access agreements. And now they have said that, for example, even if a vessel operator is doing distant water fishing, and therefore, because EU makes government to government payments for these access agreements, right? These ag agreements are between governments. So between EU and say the African country in whose water EU, EU ships are fishing. So EU has an agreement with that country and EU will make pay payment to that government. Now these EU has already managed to keep this kind of payments out of the scope of the agreement. So those cannot be cut. Those need not be cut. Now EU has also added on that its operators, they don't have, they are not paying the EU for using those waters. EU is making the payment. So in effect, it's a subsidy because those operators can now fish in those distant waters without having to pay anything. So it is definitely a subsidy. But EU has now, put, this is, this was there in the earlier text, as Adam said. Now it has made a comeback. So EU is also trying to get as much exemption as possible. Whereas our distant water fishing, we do not want to do also, I guess, when we are not doing. But in case our distant water fishing ever cross 2%, we don't get any exemption. But EU and all, they get full exemption forever. So this is the kind of the still the unfairness that's the persisting in the agreement. Sorry, I just, I just need to... I just need to interrupt. Uh, Ranja, I just wanted to know, distant water fishing is... Uh, Oh, wow. How much nautical mile is it in high sea or outside is it? What does it mean? Adam? So, so the way they're defining it in this in this talk, in these negotiations, um, it says so the the FAO has regional fishery zones or areas. And so basically it says if you fish beyond, so, you know, every every coastline is part of one, right? So if you fish beyond the one that's adjacent to your existing uh, fisheries area, then that's classified as distant water fishing. And then it says... That is, right? Right? Sorry, that is the see. EZ. That is the EZ, right? Up to 200 nautical mile I'm talking about. Uh, so there's two things. The EEZ is 200 nautical miles. Yep. But the, so the, the I'll try and find the, the diagram. There's a diagram of FAO fishing areas. And so for, for India, um, you know, th th that would be, you know, I'll, I'll find the diagram and put it in the chat, but say, say for Australia, right? If we were to fish, if Australia was to then fish in, uh the north pacific that would be beyond that would be classified as distant water fishing but if we were to fish in fiji you know or around fijian waters then that's that wouldn't be classified um I, as distant water fishing because it's only in the one adjacent to the one that australia is in does right. that make sorry that's yeah, uh, so, i'll find the picture and you can it yeah, makes I think it the make, picture will be way. good so basically, it is your up to EZ in any case, you have rights. And then after that, they are allowing you to fish in one FAO adjacent area. So 
And so these are so because many countries fish in these neighboring waters, right? Because they have migratory stocks, this that. I think it's al it's to allow for that. So if they are giving you one level more flexibility. Beyond that, it will be considered distant water fishing. Right. Sorry, one sec. I'll bring it up. Let me just share my screen just to show you. No. Um, here, you should be able to see this now. All right. So you can see. So I assume you can see it. Um, but you can see how it's, you know, these very straight lines on a very curvy globe. But, you know, so, you know, like Australia, right? So Australia, if you take Australia, you know, it's adjacent, you know, so 57 okay. is its um, FA zone. So if it was to fish over here in 47 or 48, oh, that would be beyond the one that's adjacent to it. Right, right. Yep. So th that, that's how they're defining distant water fishing. You know, it, I think previously it had been defined as anything beyond your EEZ, but within these talks, they've defined it like this because, uh, I mean, you know, th that's a whole argument and conversation that they've been having. Um, but that that's kind of, these are the fishing zones that they're, that they're talking about. And so, so, but sorry, just to clarify, what's really interesting about this is, you know, it's it's hard to immediately understand who is fishing where, and who gets caught up in these um, this definition, and particularly the definition when it relates to more than two percent of you know your your national catch comes from a different um, EEZ or you know or the high seas. Um, so yeah, so th that's kind of where where that's at. So it, it, even though it's ostensibly trying to target distant water, like, like the bigger fleets, it's heavily um, conditioned, which which is you know uh, carries a bunch of of challenges for it. 